Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Aaron, Mike, and Nick. Um, we're going to talk about distilling with botanicals. Um, I always feel like we need a little bit of hold music at the beginning of these live streams while we get a few folks signed on, since Facebook doesn't let you, you know, pre-sign on or anything like that. Um, yeah, but uh, we'll just give it a few more seconds and kick into it. All righty. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Give us a thumbs up or drop a comment to us. Uh, let us know you're there. Looks like we've had a few folks joining us from all over the world already. Um, I'll run through who you've got on the Distilling with Botanicals live stream um, coming up in these slides. I hope this finds everybody well. And I uh, hope you're uh, ready to learn a bit more about distilling with botanicals. We're going to focus a bit on gin today. If you have questions outside of gin, um, our resident experts will do their best to help you out. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, you feel more comfortable playing around uh, with botanicals in your distilling process. So let's jump right into it. <clears throat> and Please feel free to grab a gin and tonic or something else related. <clears throat> what you got there, Mike? <coughs> hey, Aaron, I'm actually uh, doing hydration today, so I'll be ah, nothing too intriguing right now. Not yet. Maybe later this evening. <laughs> Not too far away from gin. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Just run through some of the key points with you here. Uh, so gonna discuss really gin and how to make a wash and showcase botanicals, some of the distillation techniques and equipment that you'll need, how to use botanicals as well as, um, you know, really our processes and um, a, a lot of different processes on how to use botanicals. Uh, how to build recipes, which I think is important for a lot of folks out there and really how to, build that um, botanical base as well. And just some guidelines around different styles uh, will be covered as we go through. <clears throat> so a uh, quick introduction to the folks on this call today. Um, I'm Aaron Hyde, hey, uh, Portfolio and Strategy Manager at Bevy. I'm based out of New Zealand, uh, had a retail shop, uh, down in New Orleans for a few years, then made my way up to Bree Malt before finding my way to Bevy um, and came through sales and marketing to uh, manage a lot of what we do with our products. So the brand you'll be most familiar with at Bevy is Still Spirits, and um, we'll probably showcase a few pieces of Still Spirits gear throughout the webinar just to give you an idea of what you can use um, to infuse with botanicals. Up next, I believe we have, I better wait for the slide because I'll guess wrong. <laughs> Nick Wiseman, Nick, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hey everyone, um, so uh, I've been with the company for about six years now. Um, and uh, like Aaron, uh, I actually came up through sales uh, there and now I work uh, uh, alongside Aaron you know, as a product manager. Um, so a lot of hands-on with products and, and seeing things through from ideas to hit in the market. Um, been brewing beer for quite a long time and uh, since the late 90s with a bit of a, a break um, uh, due to an uh, employment at the time uh, and then got back into it and then, uh, yeah, into the company. So really love uh, distilling. I've um, started doing some studies in it. I've got lots of books just reading myself and histories and things like that. Uh, and of course, gin is just one of those drinks that you can do so much with that uh, is, uh, uh, you know, an endless um, amount of uh, things you can do. So it's great to be here, part of this, and um, hopefully share some of my knowledge and, and, and also, um, you know, learn some more because we can always keep learning. Awesome. Next, we've got Mike. Hey, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Aaron, good to see you guys. Hey, Nick. So my name is Mike Brennan. I am with the BSG Handcraft. Uh, I'm based out in Seattle, Washington, over in the United States. 
I'm the North American sales manager for the handcraft division. We service uh, home brew supply shops, home distillation, uh, retailers, uh, et cetera, in the retail side. Uh, I've been with the company for about three years now. Prior to BSG, I worked for a startup called Pico Brew, where we uh, had some small automated small batch brewing systems. And we also developed a small uh, semi-automated still called the Pico Still, it's a vacuum still. Uh, I was involved in a lot of the later stage development of that uh, device, as well as I was our distiller in residence. So I did quite a bit of uh, gin distillation at the time as a showcase for uh, what our products could do. Prior to that, uh, did some other uh, distillation projects. In my previous role before taking over the handcraft division, I worked with uh, commercial craft distillers here in the Pacific Northwest, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, supplying botanicals, other types of uh, uh, all the base fermentables and such for making uh, all sorts of spirits. But there's a special love for gin up here in the PNW. A lot of great distilleries here. Uh, some really fun, creative projects. Uh, I've been involved in beer making and other fermentation things for about 25 years now. And I do a lot on the, uh, the more professional beer judging side, but uh, a lot of that crosses over what we do in botanicals as well for distilling gin. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah. There's your panel of folks for our gin discussion today. We are also going to be talking to Justine from Mount Fife Distillery very soon here. Um, please feel free to drop any questions for us or Justine in the chat. Um, we're always happy to help and to provide a bit more information uh, where we can. So um, we'll be monitoring the chat on Facebook. Um, as much as we can. So there's Justine. We're going to be chatting to her. She's got a couple great gins on the market down here in New Zealand um, uh, and uh, learn a bit more about her process and uh, how she got into distilling. All right. So I think the next topic that we are looking at is going to be focused a bit more on gin. And the reason we're focusing on gin is because gin is probably the most um, widely known infused um, spirit. So the gin also gives you pretty much a really nice base to really play around with some of these botanicals. Um, some of you might be familiar with Jennifer. That's how Juniper got started. Uh, got started as a bit of a medicinal style uh, spirit, which is very popular. Um, maybe was an excuse to drink a little bit for folks, but they definitely believed in uh, infusing alcohols and alcohol as um, as something that was very medicinal and they'd make tonics and spirits. And um, and they, they definitely um, had a belief that uh, gin and juniper um, helped prevent the Black Plague. Um, so, um, you know, good reason to drink. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was some monks and... Uh, Oftentimes, uh, you'll see notes in history around gin where it was actually um, used to mask some of the flavors of really poorly made vodka. Um, so juniper was um, at hand, a very strong flavor, could sometimes hide some of the poor fermentation and distillation flavors um, that you get from a really clear eau de vie or uh, vodka at the time. So people started playing around with that and um, started adding more herbs and spices to the distillation, of course, um, for medicinal purposes and in tonics and that sort of thing. And farmers and, uh, and apothecaries started growing their own herbs to put into their gins and Jennifer's um, to create their own tonics and blends. And it wasn't really until about the 18th century in England that it was um, popularized more as a drinking spirit, something that you could just enjoy every day. And, uh, and in England, um, they really came up with a blend of botanicals that uh, sticks around until this day, which is uh, really interesting. I mean, very little has actually changed, minus a few new modern approaches to gin. So in terms of the distillation and maybe the infusion techniques, but otherwise, um, the recipes of then are oftentimes the recipes of now. <clears throat> so uh, next slide, we'll take a look at what um, really defines gin. 
in most places, there needs to be a very distinct juniper flavor. And the use of juniper, even in small quantities, is mandated in some countries for gin. So um, it is one of those things where uh, uh, juniper really drives the flavor of the spirit. And uh, the use of other botanicals in it to add flavor and aroma is actually sometimes a legal requirement as well to call it gin. Otherwise, it could be called something else. Um, and it's typically clear, um, but can be aged on wood or flavored post-distillation, um, which adds some color. And I think one thing that's really important for um, homemakers is to understand that really any base you want to use for gin can be used. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot of commercial examples out there uh, with a lot of different um, different sugar bases or sugar substrates uh, that they use to create their gins on top of. And a lot of times if those add a bit of flavor, it's not a bad thing. It just kind of helps balance out some of the botanicals or add a different flavor to the botanicals that are in there. Um, most are bottled between 35 and 60. I think we'll have a few gins that we might share with you along the way here, um, maybe point out uh, different varieties of gin that are available, uh, maybe at different ABVs, maybe with different sugar bases, maybe with different colors. Um, <clears throat> and just keep in mind too that if it's a liqueur, it's been sweetened a lot of times when they sweeten it, it lowers the ABV below that 35% threshold down to about 18 to 28 or so, um, typically below 35%. And uh, gin is uh, one of those unique spirits that um, is so versatile that it's typically brewed on pot or column stills or a combination of both um, via a stripping run and then a spirit or infusion run as well. So um, really good to strip out the alcohol uh, before you uh, decide to infuse. There are folks who may infuse on the first run and that's fine too, um, but uh, uh, typically, you're collecting that spirit in a more dilute sense through a stripping run and then infusing through a spirit run. Anything pop up for you guys that you guys wanted to share on on gin here and what defines it? Or I uh, don't know if you had any gins that you wanted to share in terms of uh, maybe an example of something that's a little different or made a little differently? Well, Aaron, I can tell you that uh, in tribute to those uh, people from, you know, the middle centuries, uh, ever since having gin in my house, I have not had one single case of the Black Plague. So I, I absolutely believe that it's medicinal powers as well. Um, <laughs> as far as the, uh, the ability to be creative with gin, as we did, we chatted about prior to coming on. And looking at some styles, uh, you know, obviously we're going to focus today on, you know, the basics and getting into, a, you know, the London styles. But knowing that gin is kind of that playground where you can play with other botanicals, some of those sweeter ones that you'll find that didn't gain a lot of popularity, like old Tom gins. I happen to have an example from uh, Bar Hill out in Vermont. Uh, it's their Tom Cat that uh, they happen to do. Uh, so if you notice, it's got the amber color because they uh, age it in uh, oak barrel. And it's also uh, have some, uh, they use some honey in it and they also use some honey to distill it to get started with it. So it's uh, it's it's incredibly interesting. Um, it's got a beautiful flavor and that honey just tends to bring out what the juniper does. So it really makes the uh, that piney note pop really well. But yeah, sure. that was an interesting color. Do you want to just show that one more time real quick? Yeah, right? so you can see it's got barrel, it's got barrel time on it. So this mm -hmm. is a grain distillate. Um, he uses grain in this one, and then it's juniper and raw honey, and that's what you end up with. The uh, aromatics are extremely woody. It's more woody than it is uh, juniper, even, even almost. It's, it 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 brings you know, that barrel note really comes forward nicely. It's a very unique product. Um, I actually purchased this in uh vermont i don't think i've ever seen it outside of the state of vermont in the u.s so for this for this one specifically but i have a whole table we could talk about all afternoon <laughs> yeah um, well if... but those just back to the you know it's creativity uh trying to you know uh, being able to not just you know it, we start with that juniper base and from there uh we can you know sky's the limit yeah, I think that's a great point and really a reason that folks are attracted to gin distillers and drinkers is there's 
it's it's almost unlimited what you can do with gin, which is great. I mean, um, I think that some of those oak aged gin, oak, oak aged gins are starting to get a bit more popular, and you can see why. It just adds that those rich uh, sort of uh, subtle sweet notes of vanilla and caramel underneath that wood would present, and then balanced with the uh, berries and botanicals that you can put in there. It's just a a really unique uh, distilled product that you're not going to get anywhere else. Uh, Nick, uh, I think you have some uh, holiday-oriented uh, spirits that are over your shoulder, yes? Yeah, so you can see over here uh, I've got my uh, 12 days of, uh, of gin for Christmas. That's my event calendar for this year. Previous years I've done craft beer ones, but I thought uh, this year would be a little different. Uh, so there's actually quite a, a, a large range in there. There's some pink gins, slow gins, plum gins, uh, spice gins. There's a whole bunch of different ones in there, which is amazing to see, all uh, from Australian uh, distilleries as well, which is uh, which is really cool. There's some oak in, uh, aged gins in there as well, like you spoke about, uh, Mike, um, which is one of the things that I really love about gin is while the base kind of gin is defined uh, legally in some countries, um, and in other countries, not so much. Um, it's really open to whatever you really want to do. Um, and uh, it's easy to do an oak gin if you want at home with some, uh, if you don't have a barrel with some oak cubes or something like that. Um, and then I think we're gonna talk about it a bit later, but you can also see here, I've got uh, a bunch of uh, uh, vodka with a whole bunch of uh, uh, um, botanicals in there, which is uh, macerating. That's uh, about 24 hours now so you can see a nice color there coming through so um yeah and i mean if you want to you can redistill that out or you can filter it and drink it like that and pretend it was an oak gin as well <laughs> yeah yeah and you do start to see some of those um golden infused gins showing up where they've just taken on the color of the botanicals and oftentimes why you don't see the color of botanicals and gin is because they've been infused in the still and um you know we'll talk a little bit more about some of those methods but um yeah uh don't be don't be afraid of some of those uh gins that are a little out there compared to maybe what what you've typically tried there's there's a there's such a large selection these days that uh um just a lot of great stuff and i did want to just uh, uh i saw this question pop up and uh slow gin um is slow berries and uh and sometimes sugar uh, depending, but a lot of times it's just uh, just been aged on those berries and it takes on the color and the flavor and it's super thick, super deep, super rich color and a super awesome flavor, <laughs> I think. I can't think of a better use for slow berries. <laughs> yeah. Aaron, when you were in uh, New Orleans, uh, did you see more slow gin? I believe that's more in the southern United States that you see a little more presence of slow gin, yes? Yes, yeah, definitely the southeast for sure. Um, Virginia on down the coast into New Orleans. They definitely, there's a few craft distilleries bringing it back to prominence. I, I've seen it actually in Australia as well. Um, I think actually I visited a couple of distilleries in Tasmania that were both doing uh, their own slow gins. And um, I'll tell you what, it's uh, it's a it's a really uh, very strong, rich berry flavor. Um, I've had a few where they've uh, chapelized it or added sugar into it to sweeten it up a little bit as well. Um, but over ice, I mean, just, just yum. <laughs> That's great. I don't need, I don't know why, I don't know what, to be honest, I don't know much about slow berries or what else you do with them, but, um, they make gin taste great. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you actually do slow gin is made by, um, steeping the berries post distillation. And I think Nick actually did have a couple behind him there in darker bottles. Um, you can see that it takes on the color of the uh, the berry um, when it's done. Now, you probably could put slow berries in an infusion. I don't know how much it would do, um, but uh, yeah, there you go. So takes on the color and um, it's really nice and i've seen it i've seen it just a couple weeks and i've i've heard a couple folks do it for a couple years um you know it's really up to you um how much time you have and how much of that you want now a lot of times uh you can like really macerate the berry in there and it even gets a thicker darker color you just let it steep on the berry and it picks up a nice 
aroma. Um, slow, I would say slow gin technique does vary, but the berries almost always added post distillation um, for it to steep. So yeah, adds a really nice color to it. <coughs> honey infused or put in the oak barrels? Um, do you know if they infused that one with honey or was it um, something that they aged it with or how is the honey used in that uh, gin you put uh, like? Two ways, I believe, and don't quote me because I don't know the distiller personally, but I believe they do use um, basically a mead, a honey wash to get started with uh, for part of it, and then it's grain mainly. And then they do use honey um, post uh, distillation. So they're going to add that honey after they've completed all of the distillation runs in the final product just to add some sweetness to it. That old Tom style, uh, which kind of, you know, you saw floating around, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but late 1800s, and then it kind of floated here in the U.S. into Prohibition when you'd go to the bars and they would have that little Tomcat sign and you would put your money in and somebody would pour you and slide you a, slide you your tot of uh, gin out. <laughs> and that sign. And of course, many of those gins being poor quality would be sometimes sweetened. So it was never considered, I don't think, to be a, necessarily, we'll call it a, a fashionable style, but it's kind of come back now as a retro thing that actually is rather than trying to mask an inferior product that had maybe a little uh, little turpentine or some other things dropped in there uh, that they, you know, I brought some things back that, you know, were actually about the, about a quality beverage. So yeah. That is the funny thing about old Tom gin. It's a style all its own, but it was really meant to be a working man's gin just made pretty quick off of a still and, uh, and uh, not much to it, but I mean, honestly, the technique and recipe hasn't changed much at all. So um and and there's a lot of people bringing that style back and making it a bit more fashionable and you get to really again even though it's a longer it's got a long history and is a pretty traditional gin people people are still playing around with that style so yeah it's really cool to see um let's see what was next on our presentation so we've kind of defined gin if you have any more questions about that let us know uh we're going to dive into some of the botanicals and i think we're going to highlight about a half dozen that you really want to keep around if you're going to start playing around with gin botanicals so um uh juniper is pretty much the definition of gin um there are new world styles that don't put juniper in there uh, Nick's got a nice jar of juniper berries up there. Yeah, so um, you can typically find these dried uh, <clears throat> in um, uh, various shops, possibly your homebrew shop, if they've got an urban spice section. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a nice piney and herbal flavor, floral, citrus, really offers a lot. So, I mean, for me, I always smell that pininess when I'm drinking gin. It's just something that always sticks out to me. And that's how I know there's a good amount of juniper in it is if I catch a whiff of that pine. And then when I'm when I'm um, when I'm drinking it, it's that sort of that herbally piney flavor, some with some floral and citrus notes in there as well. Um, but definitely the definition of of gin is the use of juniper. Um, beyond that, coriander seed. Uh, so coriander um, is actually probably one of my favorite flavor contributors um, to gin. It's very uh, lemony, limey, and a very sort of distinct way um, is probably the best way to put it. It's a, um, It's got that herby sort of lemon uh, aroma as well. And if you're familiar with Belgian whipped beer, um, Blue Moon, you can kind of pick up that coriander note in there. Um, it's, it's a really nice uh, contributor to gin and is probably the second most used botanical in most uh, gins and uh, very commonplace. Um, uh, of course, uh, there is a nice note down there that some variations can taste soapy. And actually, if you use a lot of coriander in your gin, it can get very, uh, it can get very uh, lemony, kind of almost pine salty sometimes as well. Just a strong soap flavor. So something to watch out for. Um, cassia cinnamon. Uh, so this is one that's a really nice way to add sort of a soft spice note to your gin. Um, 
Kasi and cinnamon are completely different, but we kind of treat them the same when we talk about gin um, and really adds a sweetness to the gin as well. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. Uh, can be somewhat aromatic uh, and spicy in the aroma as well. Actually, the gin and tonic I'm drinking, I'm calling it sort of a Christmas gin, has a good amount of cassie and cinnamon in it. Um, I was just lacking in some of my roots and um, and so use that. If you use coriander, could you then also use bay leaves and or Tahitian lime leaves with it? Yes, definitely. Um, you can uh, definitely use uh, a variety of citrus leaves, uh, lime leaves specifically. Um, none of those are really going to detract from the coriander. Now you're just gonna wanna find the balance that works for you. Um, like if you're making a citrus gin, uh, coriander and lime leaves along with actual lemon zest or peel is gonna be a great way um, to make a citrus gin for sure. <clears throat> Do you crush the coriander seeds? You can crush the coriander seeds. A lot of botanicals don't actually need to be treated because um, the amount of steam and pressure coming up through there um, pulls a lot of those oils out. Mike, did you want to say something about that? No, I was just uh, like you had mentioned, just that you, you know you're in alcohol once you're you know once you're steeping or macerating and things. Although uh, a random note, like with juniper and things with full skins, um, you know, you usually want to you know use those not in your highest proof because sometimes that uh, the skins can get a little bit uh, tough and sometimes harder to get extracted. You're better off with that middle proof. But I'm sure we can talk about that during our process. Yeah. yeah. Just... One other, real quick, one note on uh, cinnamon also is look at your source of cinnamon. There's about four, there's I believe four major kinds of yeah. cinnamon in the world. And you want to definitely, uh, different ones will express differently. I tend to personally like the, the Vietnamese Saigon styles. They tend to come forward a little nicer. The Chinese, the those types tend to be a little, I find them to be more woody than cinnamon-like in my infusions. So, mm, really good note, Mike. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, just to add to the uh, uh, crushing the seeds or, and, and any other botanicals, it's one of those questions that is, um, uh, there's no real answer uh, depending on the distiller, right? So uh, different distillers like to do different things. And I think it's something that uh, can often come down to people who um, uh, find what you like best, you know, because you can get different notes from it. Um, and and the, uh, depending on the, the if you are just vapor infusing macerating a combination of both, you could get different results completely. So it's something that uh, if you have the time and and uh, ingredients, then uh, play around and, and see what works best for yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, good notes, guys. Yeah, if you uh, let's. It's always good to call out some of those specifics um, because cassia and cinnamon do vary so much and and taste very so much. Um, play around with your botanicals, uh, learn the ones that you're um, you know you have available, and um, really figure out what you can do with those. So yeah, definitely. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, do you think air still is any good at making gin? Yes, let's touch on this just for a minute here. <laughs> Take a break from the botanicals. Um, do either of you guys have an air still handy by chance right now or no? Uh, no, I do not, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I've right. got T500 set up for us to look at, but I didn't, uh, I don't have an air still. No yet. problem, no problem. Uh, bad, uh, bad sales uh, on our part, not having a. <laughs> Air <laughs> still handy, but um, air still is a nice little tabletop still. And for those that aren't familiar with it, it is a um, it is a uh, air based cooling condenser. So it uses a fan to cool down. So you can really utilize this anywhere um, without having to worry about a water source for cooling your condenser. Makes it really handy. It's honestly probably the best way for you to get into distilling spirits. Technically, it's just a small pot still um, that uses a fan to condense. And I think the answer to your question is yes, the air still can make very nice gin. Um, we actually sell a gin basket for the air still. Um, oh, there you go. We've got the gin basket handy for the air still. Um, really simple, easy to use still, really 
great way to play around with gins. Nick, I know you've done some work on the air still with gins um, and with pretty good results, right? Yeah, look, uh, I think the air still is fantastic for, for doing gins. And, and to be honest, uh, there are a lot of people who, who think the same in, in various groups and uh, and forums and things like that. Um, so it's it's a compact little still that can just deliver, uh, especially on the flavour. Uh, and again, it allows you to play around with different methods, you know, maceration, just you, if you just use the basket and vapor. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, and then the good thing is if for those who do have bigger um, systems, it's a great way to uh, do some testing, some experiments. Uh, but at the same time, if you grab the best of a Hearts run, uh, you know, that's four litres in, in, in an air steel. That's a good couple of bottles of um, some decent gin you can make. So um, I do know quite a lot of people who predominantly use it as a, as a gin steel, and that's it. Yeah, and just to touch on that a little bit, um, the uh, the the air still is really just a small pot still and so we we kind of mentioned earlier you can use a pot still or a reflux still now um if you're doing that second run with botanicals on a reflux still actually mike's got one set up right there behind him over his shoulder with a reflux column um and our copper alembic dome there um if you set that guy up and he's got packing inside of him to create reflux, you're going to take away some of that oil content. So you're just going to want to unpack that column on your second run when you're doing your infusion. Just want to call that out. Uh, traditionally, a lot of folks do use Alembic stills or pot stills like the air still or just like that copper Alembic dome with a condenser arm coming off of it that Mike's got behind him. And, um, and there you go. Yep. Just like that. So you literally could just attach that condenser arm. Yeah. I'll highlight it here. We could take yeah. uh, we could take the uh, the column off and then drop the uh, the arm on there, so the condenser arm, and then we're gonna run some uh, cold water through the um, through the arms uh, sleeve through the jacket, and that will condense our vapors, and we'll get a really nice uh, output from that as well. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's a uh, it's also a very good still for gin. Now, I'm gonna make more than the air still. Um, you can do up to 23 liters, six gallons in there. So um, you need to come out with a pretty good amount of gin uh, by the end of the day. Um, but there is a gin basket for that as well that threads right into the bottom of those uh, T500 columns and the condenser. Um, so let's look at a few more uh, botanicals that are pretty popular. Uh, licorice root, um, really similar to you know, sassafras, star anise, the thing to really keep in mind with licorice root that I think um, some sometimes catches people off guard is that it has a pretty strong sweetness to it. And when it's balanced, it's got this really nice, bittersweet sort of anise licorice note to it. Um, it can have a bit of a fennel style aroma, um, but it's it all those sort of botanicals that I've just mentioned as aromas and flavors can kind of contribute very similarly to licorice root. I would say the thing to think about with licorice root is it can be quite sweet um, and uh, and can contribute a little bit of uh, sort of a, I'd almost say a subtle mouthfeel if you use a lot of it. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, angelica root is probably the most important root and it's a really nice um, earthy base note. And uh, for those of you that maybe are more of a flavor or food technologist than I am, having some of those base notes in your um, gin can be extremely valuable to really carry uh, the rest of the flavors that are in there and really lay the foundation for what your flavor is. So uh, another one that we'll talk about in just a second is orris root, but angelica root is kind of the number one um, uh, used root for that reason. And then citrus, uh, especially citrus peel, um, is especially popular. Uh, and there's some nice dried citrus peel. Uh, you can use fresh citrus peel. You can use fresh zest. Um, just if you're going to use citrus, don't use too much pith. If you're going to use it fresh, um, it can get quite bitter, surprisingly bitter for um, how little you can use. So uh, just keep that in mind. But of course, um, citrus is a classic flavor in gin. And um, you can really, you can actually use citrus leaves in a lot of cases. You can use citrus peel. 
Um, you can just use this, uh, the zest of the skin. Um, really nice aromatic notes from those. And if you're looking to uh, collect some more gin botanicals, I think this is a great list to really focus on. Um, there's a, a, a few other things on here that are, are probably worth calling out, um, like uh, Quebec and Orris Root we mentioned, and Grains of Paradise gets used. And you don't need to buy a lot of Grains of Paradise to play around with Grains of Paradise. It's a tiny little peppery thing that'll add a ton of flavor um, to your gin if you overuse it. And um, you'll probably see in some of our recipes, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about recipe design, where some of these, um, if they're quite a big flavor, you don't need a lot of them, especially as a home distiller. Um, any favorites up there for you guys in terms of gin? Or um, hop in on Arnaud's question. Um, that we just had to talk here. So citrus peel is interesting. Um, you did uh, kind of allude to uh, being careful with how much you use, and there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is it also tends to be a reason some people, once they uh, uh, dilute their gin down to drinking strength, may see it go cloudy. So, uh, and, and maybe I'm not pronouncing this right, but lushing um, is uh, when uh, those, uh, the oils, those um, botanical oils are not uh, anymore able to be dissolved in, in the uh, alcohol. There's too much water and they will come out and be cloudy. Um, a number of ways you can fix that just quickly is you can um, bring it back up to strength, redistill it, um, or just keep it at uh, what we call, you know, barrel strength, navy strength gin, which is not always a bad thing to do that. Um, in terms of the use, as the question originally asked, um, again, it, it it, it depends on, 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 on the distiller, uh, how you like it. Um, I've done both um, and uh, you tend to have it sitting in the, um, in the boiler as well as macerating um, and often in the vapour path. Um, I've probably not done enough to work out which is best for me, um, but uh, you can do it all those types of different methods. Awesome. And I'll call out um, one that I'll talk about for a moment is orris root. Orris being on your list, and Aaron, like you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, that you know it's oftentimes you know Angelica being one of those you know, those uh, classic base components. Orris goes along with it. Orris is unique because it's uh, it acts as an aroma uh, fixative. Basically, it's uh, uh, orris really helps to hold aromas and bind them. Uh, you actually find uh, interestingly enough, in uh, perfu fine perfume making, uh, orris is a, a very important part of the base constituent to uh, hold the hold aromas stable. So you'll find in gin it will pull that in. It's actually the uh, the dried uh, it's the, the bulb of the iris uh, flower plant. So very different. It doesn't have any uh, doesn't have any aromatic uh, comparison to the iris flower. But as that uh, that that base uh, component in there. Um, it does have a floral note. It has a little bitty, bitter and woody note, but most importantly, you can find that it will help you hold and retain the uh, aromatics in your gin in your final product by using some orris. So I'm fascinated by orris by how it, uh, how it comes through in gin. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, typically when talking about fennel, we're talking about the fennel seed. Um, there's probably other parts of fennel that you can use. I have not, um, but fennel seed. Um, is typically what ends up in uh, gin botanicals. Cool. So if you have any more botanical questions, please feel free. I think we're um, about to pop our guest on and introduce Justine to you and talk a bit about her gins and the botanicals that she uses and a bit about her gin story as well. Hey, Justine. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm kind of, I feel I'm in the company of experts and I'm, and I'm not an expert. <laughs> I love That's it. all right. <laughs> and I kind of like experimenting and I like a challenge. And before I realized I was well and truly into this whole game and <laughs> love it. So having um, launched four months ago, I'm by no means an expert but what I do have is is buckets of passion and um, inspiration for looking at what's in your backyard and just 
trying lots of different methods and different ways and not being fearful to give things a go as well. Um, just going out and enjoying it. It's wonderful, isn't it? I love it. I love drinking it juice. Is. <laughs> it is. And I think you need to have a bit of that adventurous spirit to make uh, a really fun, unique gin. And um, so just tell us a little bit about your story as somebody who's new to the gin distilling world. Um, I'm originally from the UK, so gin's obviously quite big in the UK. Um, and I did my typical, uh, when I was 20, drunk a bottle of Gordon's and um, cried and vomited for a week after and never went back to gin for about 10 years. Um, someone gave me Bombay Sapphire after that, and it was always oh, different. And then all of a sudden, Hendrix with cucumber, and it was, whoa, this is different. And then the botanist. So that kind of very gradual lead up into botanical gin. Um, I'm a midwife by trade, so came to New Zealand 20 years ago um, as a midwife, married my um, husband, who's a sheep farmer in Kaikoura, had two boys, couldn't get back into midwifery, and the earthquake hit, the big Kaikoura earthquake, so that that stumped me with, okay, well, I can't, um, I can't get back into midwifery, so what can I do? I'm a busy person, want to do different things, so I'll milk sheep, and my husband said, no, because if you milk sheep, I have to look after the sheep when you're not here, right, I'll raise calves, no, same thing, I'll breed pig, <laughs> no, same thing, I love gin, I'm going to make gin, perfect I don't like gin don't want anything to do with it there's the garage go for it so <laughs> I booked onto a, a course in Auckland to just because there's there is lots of information out there but it is quite hard to collaborate um, and just really fine-tune the basics of making a good gin so um, I went on a course to Auckland and that was the introduction to um, basic uh, you know pot um, still gins and having the basic um, botanics to work from. And that just gave me, it just opened my heart to, whoa, I come from a farm in Kaikoura. We've got, look at what we've got on our doorstep around, around us here. And what can I make? So I bought a still, and this is the little copper alembic still that I bought. Oh, nice. Background. So isn't it beautiful? It's like eye candy, isn't it? Oh, it and is. Such a, an That's easy beautiful. <laughs> so it's only a three liter um still but this is how i started doing my my testing runs um with it but the 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 way to make a gin when you've got something very simple like just the copper alembic still um it makes sense to me i didn't know much about it i've got a medical background um and then a sheep farming background and then two little rug rats running around wondering what i was doing a mum's making gin going to school mum's making gin mum drinks gin um, which is great, but it makes a lot of sense in a pot like this. So this is Teddy, my little testing still. Um, <laughs> initially, without dropping, without dropping the still, um, what I wanted to do was to um, create gin um, via a story. But by having a story behind the botanics I wanted to use meant um, I started to understand how botanics work and how they were going to work. Um, so my first gin that I came up with, and this is called um, Woolshed Gin. I'll make sure I get this the right way around. Um, and Woolshed Gin is all about the farm. And what I wanted to do was go around the farm and have a look at botanics on my farm and how I can um, find, you know, when you're talking about the botanics earlier, you said, you know, your core botanics there, you've got to have juniper in to call it a gin. Um, you're going to want to play with coriander, angelica root, oris root, all these really important botanics that will bind and create your, give you a really good gin foundation. Then I went exploring on the farm. OK, what can I find? What can I get from the farm? And what I found was things like um, kanuka. And I wanted sustainable things, things that I knew I could grow that were growing heaps. I could pick them, dry them so I could use them all year round. Um, and then I could um what goes with a kanuka so what what do i want along with kanuka that's very piney that's quite um heavy so a lifting one so what about elderflowers elderflowers are beautiful um and elderflowers grow all around our lamb pen so this little one's been sitting here for the elder it's elderflower season at the moment and it has been sitting on this desk here for half an hour and it's really wilted but that's great because i'll hang it up and i'll dry it and use it um but elderflowers are beautiful they've got the most incredible um nose they're floral um they're caramelization they're sweet they're subtle everyone's got a memory of elderflower i think from growing up you know their grandparents made elderflower cordial or or whatever so it's got a real familiar smell to people and it's um, a beautiful botanic to use in gin um, i added rosemary from the garden and mint from the garden in my woolshed gin um, just because they're accessible they're around here um, i can utilize them 
um, and they work well together. I, I have a, um, I do gin distilleries and tours. And when I first launched four months ago, people will ring up and say, oh, can we come for a tour? And I'd apologize and say, of course you can, but please, um, it's not big. I work from a garage and there's not a lot going on here. So don't expect a big distillery. And um, now they ring up and say, can we do a tour? And I say, okay, yep, no, look, it's from a garage, but don't be um, disillusioned by that. It's small, but boy, can I talk. <laughs> there's lots to talk about. Um, and it's, I love disseminating information. I love chatting to people who enjoy drinking gin and they want to understand the process. And um, using the copper alembic stills, it's not a complicated process. Um, if you've got the base foundations right, so if you can create a good smooth gin and then a good rounded mouth feeling gin, um, then you're on to a winner. And whether it's for home distilling, so it's just a hobby um, and it's great fun to drink your own gin and you just add your tonics or your sodas or whatever you want to add with it or neat um then it's you know it's, it's a fantastic game to start playing but i wanted to go in commercial i wanted to show um i wanted to do this properly and i wanted to show my children that with hard work we can we can find things so it took me 27 attempts to come up with woolshed my son's 10 and he drew this um picture here which is an old woolshed um on the bottle which is great and he loves telling everyone at school that um, he drew a picture on the gin bottle that mum makes now. <laughs> um, so the Woolshed gin is a classic London dry gin. So as you saw with my little wee Alembic still, um, it's um, I have a bigger, bigger still, 40 litre still called Bruce. Um, and that's how I make all my stills. I don't macerate. I don't steep. I don't crush. Um, it's I have ethanol, which I buy in. And the reason I buy in, I don't make my own ethanol. A is space. B is time. Uh, see, I'm a one man band right the way through. But probably most importantly, I wanted my startup base to be so high um, that it will create a smooth gin. So um, I buy in a sugar based ethanol um, from Kaipoi, which is just down the road from me. Um, and that sits at 96 and a half percent. So that's phenomenally high. It's, it's beautifully high, very smooth. I um, dilute that down to 40 to, um, 40 percent alcohol by volume using our own spring water from the farm. And that goes into my pot. Um, so, so my ethanol is in my pot, obviously. My, uh, all my botanics, I put them in two layers in, in my column. And then obviously when I start doing uh, my gin run, it goes through the swan neck and down through the condenser and it comes out at about, it starts at 85% uh, with my heads and then the hearts, obviously. And then I, the tail ends, I keep tasting until I kind of feel, right, that's it, that's where I'm cutting. Um, the roundness comes with my gins, I find. Now, I, I, the other thing I think is always quite important is that every gin distiller will have a different method of doing things. And you, I speak to some of my colleagues in the business and the way they do things is differently from I do what, how I do things. And I don't think there's a wrong way. There's certainly some fundamentals in gin making that's important. But at the end of the day, if you enjoy what you're doing and if you create something that you really love and it's well balanced, well rounded, it's smooth um, and it's a good gin, then however, which way you get to it um, is perfect. And um, for me, making a good rounded gin, I'll keep talking. <laughs> you can stop me whenever you want. But <laughs> well, keep you going. Want. Keep, please, tell us, <laughs> tell us more. No, no. Um, so, I mean, the way I, I define roundness in a gin is I look at a tree and I look at the botanics I use and I think, okay, well, I want to, um, I want some earth and some roots in my gin. I want some, a trunk and some bark in the gin. I want the, the branches and the twigs. And then I want some leaves and I want some berries and I want some flowers. And if I've got all of that, then I should have, if I've done my calculations right with the fractions and you, someone mentioned about, you know, how much juniper versus coriander, there are fractions. And there is a table that you should stick with because that will give you the roundness and the smoothness of the gin. Um, then you can't go wrong. So so the Woolshed was my first gin that I did. Um I started this journey two years ago, so it's been quite quick. The moment you start looking at going commercial and you're looking at bottles, so you're looking at um, pretty unique bottles, you don't want anyone else to suddenly come out with that bottle and you don't want anyone else to come out with your flavors. So the game's on. You've got to get going, <laughs> get your design going, get the marketing going, figure out what you're doing. And I didn't want to launch with one. I wanted to launch with two. So um, this is the other one that um, I do, which is called Shearwater Gin. Now, the, the big thing with my gins, too, was because they're story inspired, I wanted to use botanics that told the story. Um, Shearwater gin is all about Kaikoura. So I'm from um, I'm from Kaikoura in the South Island. 
um, and it's known for its whales. It also has a little population of endemic um, Hutton shearwater birds. And these little birds, they breed in the mountains and then they go to the sea to feed. So with this gin, all I wanted to do, I wanted to create a contemporary style dry infused gin. So I do the same kind of method. Nothing gets steeped or macerated, but I wanted to not have the juniper forward. So your classic London dry is going to be juniper forward, like we talked about the pine notes. That's the typical gin flavors that start coming through on the palate. But this is contemporary, which means you've got another predominant flavor coming through first. And for this, it's seaweed. Um, and the main, it's obviously got juniper in it. That's the main botanic to, to make it a gin. But seaweed is a predominant flavor on the nose um, and also on the palate. It's quite caramelized on the palate. So I mix that with um, rose hip from the mountains um, and blue borage from the mountains. And these are rose hips. I don't know if you can see. I'm just getting my camera angle right. But these are <laughs> rose hip skins. And they come from um, the high country farm just around the back. But we go and pick about 20 kilograms, which I dry and then I um, zhuzh up in the machine to get rid of all the little hairs and they be they're beautiful. Now the seaweed, this is an interesting botanic to use. Um, oh, I'm not very good at this Ooh. camera angle. So there's this Karengu seaweed from the Kaikoura coast um, and it's, it's quite purpley, this is dried um, and it's sweet seaweed. So you can use this in cooking. Um, I think some people sort of, you can grind it up and use it into face products as well. It's really good for you. Um, and it's kind of sweet, but it is, um, it's on the Kaikoura coast. I have a licensed harvester that can license this seaweed for me. I don't go and pick it from the high tide mark. I couldn't put that into a product and sell it <laughs> commercially, but this is <laughs> a board and licensed. Um, at the moment, my problem is that we can't get back out there and pick up any more seaweed or, or license, the license guy can't pick it up. Because of the earthquake, the seabed was lifted. And so everything, mm. all um, of the, the shells, the power, the uh, crayfish and the seaweed um, is off limits. This is currently coming back on limits in a year's time. So I have a year, um, hopefully, of, of seaweed left to put in my shearwater gin. So there's not that many, um, there isn't that many gins in New Zealand that use um, seaweed. A lot use kelp, the bull, sometimes the bull kelp, but there's, there's so many different seaweeds, nori seaweeds, there's so many different seaweeds. This is the only one that uses the karengu seaweed and that it's the predominant flavor, unless, I mean, there's new gins coming out all the time. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a very nice, refreshing drink. I like to drink in the afternoon with a really nice grapefruit soda, and it makes a cracking little, very easy to, to drink down. Um, but yes, so they, these are my two, my two gins that I um, launched on four months ago. So I have only been in business for four months, and it's been um, a whirlwind. I've loved it. Thank you, John. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's. It's a really great story to hear, and uh, I love that you're uh, really playing on the uh, the local story that you have there to tell as well. And seaweed, I think, is a great thing to touch on. You know, kelp seaweed uh, it really just shows that there's pretty much limitless um, options. You did talk about um, wool shed. I think you said you did about 27 iterations before you really nailed it. Yeah. How long did it take you to really uh, dial in shear water? Uh, three. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and it was maybe because I understood how botanics work a little bit more. So I kind of knew I had to get that whole plant in. But I also, because it was story, I want you, I mean, it, it has six botanics in it. So juniper, coriander, angelica root. Um, and all I wanted was botanics from the mountain and seaweed. And I just wanted to give it a go and see. So I, I literally put them all into the pot and uh, did a gin run and it came out and I, tweaked it twice before I was really happy with what I had. Um, there's a really lovely lady, um, Jill uh, Mul Mulvani from Alembics up in Waiheke Island. And she's mm. um, a botanical master uh, person. She, what she doesn't know about botanics, um, you know, she's been in the game for a very long time. And I sent her up the sample and I said, you know, what do you think? I wouldn't change it. She says, it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> I said, but it's only taken me three attempts. There must be something wrong with it. I've, I've got to, you know, there must be something else. No, it's perfect. I said, there's no citrus. You change the profile. You don't want citrus in this shearwater gin. This is the this is the gin. It's it's seaweed, but you've got the um, the the berries and the that kind of caramelization from those rose hips, which are a classic kind of um, flavor that comes through. And that mixes really well with the seaweed and creates a salty, sweet wonderfulness in your mouth. Um, it's it's, yeah. it's a really refreshing. It's wonderful. 
But thank you, Lauren. Um, it's, I think it's really important to find connections with the land. I love the fact that the tourists are starting to come back, albeit New Zealand tourists at the moment. But they come to Kaikoura, they want to see the whales, they want to see some dolphins, and now they come for a gin tasting. And that's great. And to show people what what is on the land and just to open the or open your eyes, have a look around, go and smell something, put it in your mouth. Not deadly nightshade, not things like that, foxgloves, but, you know, the... <laughs> <laughs> be aware of what you're putting in your mouth but give it give it a go you know just bite it a little bit in your teeth and then let it roll around and see what the flavor is and then just go and play with that flavor nothing's wrong yeah. here and if you come across a flavor that you think that doesn't work put it to one side it could work with something else but and go with your gut it's such fun making gin it really is i love yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad yeah. you're so passionate about it justin justine yeah. um it's one of those things where and I love the advice that you gave really just about tasting botanicals. I mean, because you can learn so much just wow. about tasting those botanicals, steep them in a tea even ahead of time, that sort of thing. I mean, you can really learn a lot. I think one thing that some folks might not be familiar with if they're not from New Zealand and they're watching this is the Kanuka that you said you used. And that's a tree here locally. But tell us a little bit more about how you use that and um, what part of the tree you're using and such. So Kanuka Manuka, who knows, they, they are two different species, obviously, but they can look quite familiar. We have Manuka and Kanuka on our farm. We've got some hives on our farm. So um, I asked the beekeeper, um, you know, what, what do you think we have around? He said, well, it all depends where the bees go to where they land. So Kanuka is um, essentially it's, it's a bush and we use it for shelter for our stock. Um, it's, it is prolific in New Zealand. It's all over the place. And the smells, so they start flowering. Thankfully, they don't flower at the same time that the elderflower flowers, um, because I wouldn't have enough room in my distillery to dry everything all at once. Because at the moment, I'm dr drying elderflowers like, no, tomorrow I've got to have a year's supply. Um, but we've got a lot of elderflowers around the place. So Kanuka, um, it, it flowers in about three or four weeks time. So around Christmas or just after Christmas. Um, it's essentially quite piney. Um, it's got quite almost like a eucalyptus kind of smell um, to it. And little tiny little white flowers come out and it's a branch, lots of little branch with pine needles and then lots of white flowers. And I haven't got a picture of it. I'm sorry, I should have brought some uh, Kanuka in to show you. Um, and um, the flavors that I get from Kanuka is they are very earthy. They're very piney as well. So I think they work really well with juniper. So the, the two go well hand in hand. I add mint as well to the wool shed and I think that gives it almost a medicinal flavor that comes through with the wool shed but it it's a it works the combination works really well so I pick the Kanuka um yeah from about December mid-December onwards and I dry it like anything and then I store it to use it the whole year round um it's a wonderful botanic to work with it's very versatile um and the aroma it brings uh, on the nose when you when I smell I open up a wool shed and I smell it my um nose is instantly drawn to that Kanuka pine nutty um, richness that, that comes through quite strongly on the nose um, with mm. the bullshit. It's fantastic. It's a lovely botanic. It's easy to work with too. It's lovely. Yeah, that's a great suggestion because there's so many uh, there's so many flowering plants and trees and bushes mm. out there that folks can delve into um, and uh, and really experiment with and uh, have yeah. something local like that in your backyard is great. Is there anything yeah. else that you're looking to? Um, put out in the near future in terms of gin or any uh, botanicals that you're looking to grow on the farm or experiment with more? Look, I'd love to. I mean, I think there are so many gins on the market um, mm. and people are launching different blends of gin all the time. And um, I had someone else on another live stream um, ask me the same question. I'm sort of, oh, look, I'd love to try barrel aged. I'd love to try a little bit of this. But at the end of the day, um, I'm a one person band. So I do everything from picking my botanics to drying them to then making the gin. My brother's a graphic designer, so he makes, makes the labels in, from England. Um, and then I make boxes that the gin goes in to get shipped away. The boxes are just behind me on the table here. Um, and, um, and then the marketing, the social media, everything takes time. I've also got a farm and two boys and a busy life trying to run ultra marathon. So there's a lot going on in my life anyway. I don't want to stretch myself too thinly. I'm fully aware that shelf life on in liquor stores is quite thin. I don't want to bulk out those. So I want to do something and I want to do it really well. Now, I'd love to play with kaffir, uh, not kaffir, I'm sorry, uh, with kawakawa. Um, I love native botanics. So I don't have kawakawa growing on the farm, but I'm in search for kawakawa to have a go with, with things like that. And we have a local producer that produces coffee. So 
I'd love to try some blend that, but it might just be a hobby try. Sure. <laughs> I think it's sure. really important to, um, you know, that it, it'd be lovely to bring se some seasonal gins out. I'd, I'd love to do a summer gin because we've got a garden full of ro raspberries and rhubarb um, and cherries, and there are different things that you can do with them. But um, I'm also learning so much. I mean, I have been in this business for two years from the word go, and I launched four months ago. So, I mean, I don't know an awful lot. And I learn so fast. I mean, my very first attempt at drying something was uh, the kofi flower. So if you know the kofi, the kawai or the kofi, it's yellow, mm -hmm. the little baked flowers. Yeah. I picked a load of those, dried them, and thought, oh, that's an odd kind of smell. And then my husband, who's a farmer, came and said, you know, nothing really chews on the kofi because it's poisonous. Pretty much every part of it is poisonous. <laughs> And I won't put it into a gin then, I said. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> Google Corfi before you use it and put it. I'm sure someone's going to put it in gin one day, but I don't, know when, I don't want to poison people, so I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always always probably the first rule of trying your botanicals is make sure they're safe, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No. Exactly. Well, uh, it's too bad you aren't a little closer because I've got Kawa Kawa all over um, around my house right now. But um, and uh, and have have sent it through it still and made some aerosol out of it, but I haven't put it in a gin yet, so I'll need to try that out sometime. There's, there's a few really good gins out there that use Kawa Kawa, and and it's a very unique little botanic, isn't it? It's a beautiful little peppery botanic mm. to, to use. Um, but um, yes, I'll experiment. I'm not going anywhere fast, so I'm here in for the long, long haul and the long game. So, I think you know one thing for me um, because I, I'm just it is just me. Um, it's that um, passion to do something that you love and to give something a go and to back yourself as well. Like two weeks before I launched, I decided all my friends had lied to me. I had two terrible gins. No one's going to want to buy them. <laughs> and you have to get through that little hiccup before you realize <laughs> it's actually it's okay <laughs> i really yeah. love them back them and there are plenty of people i think that really love um the gins too and it is great i love doing well covid's kind of put a bit of a damper on events and stuff but the events are gonna happen again but i did um gin indulgence a week after i launched so i i went up to the news and the spirit awards a week before i launched won the emerging product which was all about um you know i think the story behind my gins which was so phenomenal to be i went up very nervous and um, i knew no one there i was in the in this in the hilton hotel with all these brilliant um spirit distillers and there i was sort of i was like hello i'm from kaikoura mountain five you don't know me because i'm not actually launched yet i don't even know why i'm here but i'm here to say hello and then before i knew it i was, I was on stage accepting this award and it was um it was a phenomenal night and so exciting and i'll always um be um, thankful for, for realizing that the path I was on was the right path, launching a week later and then going to Gindulgence and just meeting the public and them trying the gins and saying, whoa, that's amazing. Oh, not sure about that, but I love that one. You know, getting the feedback, getting the public feedback. And then they come back for more or they come back and have a gin and tonic or they come back and buy a bottle. That was so exciting to see people enjoy the product that I mm. put so much um, care and attention and, and my heart goes into it so much. So that was brilliant. And that just fuels the fire for like, I love this. This is great. I'm making something that people love. And that's what I love. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and that's it's something that's really fun to get passionate about because you get to share it with everybody, especially as a newly minted commercial distiller. You can say, I'm super passionate about this. Try this, yeah. please. And if somebody enjoys it, then you get to share in that passion, which is so, so yeah. fun to do. So, oh, yeah. Such fun, such fun. <laughs> awesome awesome um any uh oh we just had a question pop up you have some tonics behind you are you going to cover off what brand you prefer and why tell us a little bit about your preferences in terms of uh mixers and uh mixers how you like to use well don't we all drink with our eyes first so we want to make it look good and then the nose and then the mouth so um i'm sorry but i'm not going to plug schweppes one bit stay away from schweppes if you're going to Get a good botanical gin and stick away from Schweppes until they come up with something better. There's a lot of beautiful tonics out there and sodas out there um, to, to put with botanical gins. When I first, I've got three, I have three tonics behind me here. Um, and I started off, I started off very um, simply because what I wanted to um, really shine was the gin and not the tonic. 
So this is Fever Tree Refreshingly Light. Now, um, East Imperial is a local, is a New Zealand um, tonic, and they do something called Old World Tonic, and that's very similar to the Refreshingly Light. So um, this here, it, it's low in calories, low in sugar, um, but it's got the quinine in it. And for me, a gin is not a gin without a tonic but I don't want the sugar hit as well. I don't want it to overpower the gin. All I wanted to do is enhance the gin and let the flavors of the gin come through. So I put a lot of my gin and tonics, um, my gins rather with this tonic. Um, I then started thinking, gosh, well, I need to start experimenting. And what about those people that don't like tonic and they wanted a soda? Um, and let's give people a bit of a cocktail choice. So um, I found this East Imperial grapefruit soda. I took it to, I'm not very good on the camera angles. <laughs> They're a bit wonky, but I put... <laughs> Um, shearwater gin um, and it is so refreshing now there's no citrus in the shearwater gin but you can get the citrus then from the grapefruit soda um, and it's a real summer's afternoon drink um, The I think garnishes are very important and with shearwater I always garnish with um, a sweet basil leaf and a little bit of orange peel and that goes really well with that grapefruit soda too with plenty of ice and the other tonic that I've got going on here um, is elderflower tonic now, they don't do um, elderflower tonic. They Just getting my camera angle right. I do apologize. Um, my um, the, the elderflower tonic, because Woolshed is so botanical and it has so many botanics in it, adding a different botanic on the tonic just confuses this even more. But to enhance one of the botanics that you really want to shine with the, el with the Woolshed is elderflower. I love elderflower. But to have that with Woolshed, oh, it's just, a, it's a match made in heaven. Mm. Again, because it's quite a botanical buzz going on in your mouth with the wool shed there's 12 botanics going on mint or cucumber really just soothes that down and it works really well so garnishes i think are really important because they do just provide that little extra hint of something and sweet basil is so underestimated i love do you guys all use sweet basil in your gin and tonics i'm permanently got um a bunch of sweet basil ready to just pop a few leaves into into the gin and tonics it's lovely it looks good um and it's a great little sweet herbaceous added garnish to to a gin and tonic so yes those are the those are the three the little tonics there that i've got awesome yeah i i don't i don't usually put basil in mine unless i'm ordering it at a restaurant and they put it in there all the time but uh i should be keeping it around a bit more um mm. i think it probably makes a really nice uh drink nice <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, I thought you really, used basil in there. We're usually a mint you know, over here stateside in the U.S. We tend to, you know, mint's a, a common garnish, but not basil. I like that. Mm -hmm. so. Try it. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you played around with rhubarb much at all um, in your well, gins yet? For myself, no. I've got some rhubarb plants, and I'm just growing them to get the quantity that I'd need. Um, but, again, it's a different process um and how you the rhubarb is too delicate to put through a still so it's more the after you've got a gin base and then you add your raspberries or you add your rhubarbs to macerate it in afterwards so that's a completely different process that when i have time um and when, when they're all there out there i would like to give it a go um but no i'm no expert in in that post distillation flavoring um they'll yeah. come one day yeah where do i get my yeah. bottles from so um, I use Saver Glass in um, Auckland, and Saver Glass is a company that import um, spirit bottles from Europe, from France. So these come from, from France. Now, I'm a really big supporter of local, supporting local and carbon, watching my carbon miles. But one thing I just didn't want to do was to go with um, a plain looking spirit bottle. It had to be unique. It had to be standout. Um, it had to be um, eye candy, um, you know, for, for a bottle of gin. So um, yeah, they, they do come from France. Now, I'm, I'm down to 200 bottles of gin before the next shipment is due in, and it's still in a shipping container somewhere in the Pacific. So I'm just hoping <laughs> that they come very soon because I'm going to run out before Christmas. I don't want to do that. <laughs> it, is, it is what it is. It's a worldwide thing at the moment with COVID. There's a lot of stuff that's exactly. sitting in the shipping container somewhere, but um, hopefully we'll get through. They're due in. I've been given an ETA of the 7th of December, so I'll get through to them if they're going to come through. What I'm also doing is having these in little sizes. So this is a 750 mil um, gin bottle, and they do little half sizes. It's so 37 and a half mil um, bottles of gin, and uh, that's my next go-to. So to make it into the two flavors um, in one hit, so more of a tasting or a tester for people, which would be great for them if they wanted to try both gins but didn't want to spend 
the money on you know two bottles of expensive gin yeah good call and yeah it's a challenge for everybody big and small the glass and glass and aluminum situation that we're putting our beverages into right now uh either aren't turning up or uh aren't available or are sitting on a container somewhere so yeah uh, <laughs> gets even trickier um awesome well i really appreciate having you on Justine and talking about your gins and um, congratulations on your award. Uh, I'm really looking forward to trying some of that gin out uh, when I can get my hands on it. So I'm really great to see two very distinctively Kiwi recipes that are very, very different. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on. I'm, I really enjoy talking and I really enjoy spreading my um, inspiration and the passion that I have behind this um, I'm, I'm no expert at any of this stuff, but if you just follow your heart and if it feels good, then do it. Give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice in general. <laughs> awesome, Justine. Thanks. And definitely visit Mount Fife Distillery uh, if you're on the South Island anytime soon. Justine will give you uh, the whole the whole shed. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The big tour. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justine. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Great to see somebody so passionate about making gin and um, and really using what was in her backyard to do it and, and to come up with a great commercial product. You know, interestingly, Aaron, she mentioned uh, near her, she has a coffee bean farm. And uh, I've not used it actually in gin making, but in beer, um, I've had a couple of beers that use dried uh, coffee cherry. So the actual skin, a lot of people don't realize it's a, you know, it is a little small fruit and uh, that dried skin is called cascara. So there's another one for people to add on their list. Um, C-A-S-T-A-R-A. Hmm. A really interesting flavor. I have had beers with it. Um, it's a, it's not a coffee flavor. It's something completely different. So um, yeah. Maybe that's maybe interesting. Hear us, and by the time that I get down there to visit, uh, she'll have she'll have a cascara infused. In there. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really interesting. Yeah, you see the coffee berries on trees if you're familiar with the little red berries, and hadn't ever thought about using the fruit part of the coffee. But there you yeah, go, cascara. Mm -hmm. And again, it doesn't have a coffee flavor. It's a whole different flavor. It's uh, I recall it being pretty intensely like rich, kind of more like a. I want to say like a cherry skin, but not with the sweetness, but in that kind of, you know, the, those types of, uh, you know, strong pungencies uh, that come through. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, there you go. We've got seaweed, coffee bean, fruit. Um, Absolutely. Right. <laughs> I used, uh, one of ours that I was playing with, we we're trying to do the Pacific Northwest gin, you know, sort of trying to do some cedar bowel and things like that. Uh, some uh, some needles and uh, I used kombu, uh, one of the Japanese uh, seaweeds, just a little bit. You get a little oceany thing going with it. You get a little too much. It does kind of if you you're not careful with it, you will get a little uh, a, a little uh, fit, uh, you know maybe more of a fish type of note that you don't want. So a little bit in the background, it really does like Justina said, does give that uplift to it. That's really nice. So. Yeah, yeah, right. awesome. So. Um, so we, we've touched on some of these terms um, already, but um, probably just worth calling out that there's a lot of different techniques. Like Justine said, she's using the traditional infusion method, um, but there is actually, you know, um, a maceration method uh, that can be used as well. And this pretty much allows you to steep to extract um, all those soluble components and then run them through your still. Um, so... The thing about this one that I would caution the most is probably that you can get extremely strong flavors through maceration. And sometimes you can steep out a lot of um, bitter oils and that sort of things uh, when you macerate. Have either of you guys played around with the maceration technique some? Yeah, a bit. Um, again, like you said, you know, I kind of think about it like a volume control. If I really want to go high volume, I want to really make something stand out. I would even say we'll macerate. Uh, a lot of distillers will do that. Uh, the Pacific Northwest craft distillers oftentimes will use maceration for some of those base notes that they really want to strongly come through. Or if I want, a, you know, more of a citrus punch versus more essence where I'll, I'll go for vapor infusion uh, for something when I really want to get, again, those lighter notes. 
but I tend to lean over towards more um, uh, vapor infusion myself. Yeah, one of the things I will say is, I mean, you can see this here, um, that's about, what, 18 hours or so. Uh, and you can already see the color coming through um, quite a lot on the nose as well. So uh, you need to play around with it and work out, you know, what, what, uh, what you like and what potentially is, is too long in there. And then uh, potentially looking at extracting things that uh, you don't want bitter type uh, um, flavors and, and aromas. Um, and, and, and other things so you just got to play around i guess like i've said before and, and like justine said you know there's lots of different ways to do it and and work out which way is the best for you that you like uh keep in mind with maceration there's uh a few different ways to macerate you can you can really um use this to to steep a lot of different things um so nick had traditional botanicals there we were talking about rhubarb earlier you can give that a try and in, in steeped in alcohol you're gonna have to play around a bit with time and volume like mike said it can if it's something that you really want to be punchy in your gin maceration can be one of the best ways to do it especially if it's going to be a rhubarb gin you might want to try macerating that rhubarb first um it is it is one of those uh techniques that probably actually requires um a bit more playing around before you can really uh nail it because maceration does allow a lot to steep out especially if you do it post stripping run when you're sitting in about 30 35 percent alcohol something like that from your stripping run um that alcohol will just take those compounds right out of uh, what you're throwing in there. So if there's a lot of oils that are readily available, uh, flavor compounds that can come out, alcohol is one of the best ways to get at those. And you, uh, uh, in between your two runs, you definitely will. So, um, yeah. Uh, so also another technique worth trying out is steeping. And this is something that you can do post-distillation. Uh, keep in mind that... Um, you could make a somewhat traditional gin using the steeping method if you really wanted to. Now, vapor infusion is the traditional method, but um, steeping actually does contribute color and cloudiness and haziness. This could be removed with something like a carbon filter, but that's going to strip flavor and, and um, aroma as well. So if you want to highlight color or flavor, uh, post distillation, like you want a very true to a uh, fruit flavor, say blackberry or something like that, you're going to get blackberry flavor and color coming through using a, a steeping method. And now you can steep from a from a, a neutral base if you really want to, but um, a lot of people that use steeping in gin are still starting with a base gin botanical recipe and then adding in that fruit or other flavoring. Uh, either you guys played around with steeping much at all? Uh, well, this one here, um, I'm going to uh, uh, have that. I'm going to filter it through, through some uh, coffee uh, paper uh, mm. just to get the uh, small bits of botanicals out and, and enjoy that. Um, it's uh, I've done it once before a while back. I can't remember exactly, uh, unfortunately, what I thought of that at the time, which is why I thought great timing with this to, to try it again. But one thing to think about with this is... Um, and, and Mike would probably be able to talk about that. Is is it became uh, this method became quite popular during um, prohibition, uh, you know, the old bathtub gin type thing. So um, that's something that uh, I've seen a lot of talk about on 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 uh, the uh, on the net about you know reminiscing and romanticizing those types of uh, you know pro prohibition type era uh, gin. So another thing to think about. I've seen some uh, commercial, in fact, I just saw one the other weekend, uh, some like starter craft things for home use where it's some it's a bottle with some dried uh, botanicals in it that you just add vodka to it so you can, you know, get the idea of what you're getting when you do that. The trade-off, of course, like we've said, is that you sometimes end up with uh, colors or oils that you would want under, maybe undesirable in your finished product. Um, I do, I've done very little post uh, distillation steeping in terms of a finished product, maybe, you know, something to try to put an essence on there, but uh, time, of course, like Nick, you've mentioned also uh, the amount of time you put it on and less is more, I find with steeping. Sometimes what you think you need is 
10 times more than you really do. Um, a friend of ours who we've all had on here, uh, Annie Johnson, she did, uh, when we were all uh, at our previous company, she did a, a, a gin and she has a plum tree in her backyard. She used just a few peels of the outside of the plum and did a little bit of a post uh, post distillation steep. And it was lovely. It was just enough. It brightened it up. That little, the back note of the tartness from the plum, plum came through and that was it. There was no more than that. So it was a nice way to, to bring in um, an essence of something to the gin, but not to dominate. And I think as we keep talking about this, it reminds me that it's, it's all we uh, dialed that overwhelming dial things down, start off a lot lower than you may think you need and see what happens there. Um, we talked about having an air still, the air still being such a, an easy, small access tool that you can sometimes just do a single run of a single botanical, try it out, maybe run, you know, two or three botanicals and try blending those finished, uh, spirits, uh, mm. you know, afterwards, just try them out. That's another way that you can play around because it's just so convenient with the air still, you know, it's we'll yeah. call it foolproof, but it's pretty full resistant. So. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, uh, Mike, the less is more comment is is a really good one, actually. Um, something to remember is is you can always put more into uh, when you're experimenting, but it's it's quite difficult without redistillation with a free reflux unit. And even then, a lot of these will, you know, you'll still get some of it come through um, potentially with a reflux unit redistilling. So, uh, yeah, you can always add to it, but it's it's not as uh, easy to remove. And definitely with steeping, um, you you can continue to add if you need to so the nice thing about steeping and this method is that if you add a little bit of plum or rhubarb and you're steeping and you're not getting enough flavor you can always add more so um start small and play around with the technique it's a great technique to use um just keep in mind some of the the downsides of color cloudiness haziness um keep in mind though a lot of times that we do drink with our eyes, but that may not affect the flavor um, completely. It may actually um, enhance the flavor depending on what you're going for, i.e. if you're steeping something like a plum or a blackberry and you're getting that color in there, then people know what to expect. So um, yeah, it can definitely be a really fun method to play around with, um, a really easy one. And if you wanna make it bathtub gin, all you need is a bathtub and you know, you're good to go. <laughs> All right. So uh, the classic traditional method um, is vapor infusion. And typically this is done with a botanicals basket. And what you're trying to do is push alcohol vapor up through your still. So Nick's got a um, botanicals basket that would attach just into the bottom of uh, the still spirits copper alembic dome that fits on, side, on top of the turbo 500 boiler or uh, below the T500 column. So Mike's got that behind there. And it actually just threads right in to the bottom of the column or the bottom of the condenser that goes on the dome. Um, you can see, Mike's gonna bring it over here real quick. You can see right on the bottom there. Yep, there's a nut there and then some packing above that. And you'd remove the packing and you'd uh, replace the nut with that threaded basket and it would just, um, hold the column in place instead of using that nut to hold the column in place. Uh, the basket acts as a nut and uh, makes it quite easy to really play around with gin botanicals on your T500 still. What's the basket for the air still? Does someone have to have one to hold up for me? Yes, Nick has one to hold up for you. So there's just a rim in the top of the lid and um, that pops right in there and it's really easy to pull out. There's a pull tab on the side somewhere as well. Um, Nick, I'm trying to remember, does it fit about, I know it depends on the botanicals, but is it about 30 grams that it fits in that basket? Is that about right? Um, what's well, so our packet is about 50, yeah, about 50 grams, our botanical packet, uh, and it can fit that in there. Um, it's a little, um, it is a little crowded, so, you know, best off, I'd say about 30 um yes, and yeah. uh but but you can pack that in there and and like i said too you've got to be careful with the air still if it depend on how much you are packing in there um and to ensure you just don't block anything up the top as well or, or like any um stills as well um just make sure there's uh, a little bit of space there um one thing that i do kind of want to mention because uh some people that i've talked to about gin 
have expected a vapor infusion just by throwing their botanicals in the boiler. And the challenge there is that your botanicals end up boiling and you're not actually going to get all of the aromas out. They're going to actually settle down into your boiler. So um, depending on what's actually used, you typically don't want to use your boiler. There are certain items maybe you do, but uh, you actually want the vapor to carry those oils through the still instead of actually boiling off those oils in your boiler. I can also make a comment to that, uh, learning the hard way of having juniper berries in your boiler. Uh, juniper can uh, leave behind uh, some of the resins from it will stay in the still and it, it'll take uh, it, it'll, it'll take a Herculean effort to get that that resin out of the inside of your still. And afterwards, if you don't get it completely clean, everything that you run through your still is going to have a juniper note to it until you get fully clean. <laughs> I believe you. Juniper is not a uh, subtle flavor or aroma. <laughs> and so um, it doesn't take much to flavor your gin. Uh, Nigel's asking, how much do you run off? Uh, typically, Nigel, one thing you want to do when you're when you're on your second distillation and you're using about a 35% spirit during your uh, uh, infusion run, um, is to actually take cuts during the run and to actually understand how much botanical flavor is coming through. The nice thing about taking cuts during gin is that certain oils come out at certain times and you can actually start to blend your cuts a little bit to make a nice gin based on when those oils came out. And I take, I sometimes take, depending on the size of batch I'm doing, I'm doing uh, um, a small um, a small amount of cuts each time, 200 to 250 mils, uh, 16 ounces at a time. Uh, it depends really on how familiar you are with your still and your botanicals. You can take small cuts. You can take 100 mils at a time if you have the vessels to do it and um, really take your time uh, making that. I think I just saw a note up there on the four shots. Uh, always good to pull off the, the methanol at the top or just to make sure you don't have any methanol coming out at the top um, to discard. Yeah, so vapor infusion most common method if you want to do some gin distillation as we've mentioned uh the t500 column the copper alembic dome for the t500 the air still all have gin baskets for them if you currently own a still see if there's a gin basket available for your still or a way to add those uh botanicals in so um one thing that i will note while we're kind of talking about vapor infusion is if you do have a still that you don't have a lot of um uh you don't have a basket for it and you have a way a column you could use just a muslin cloth um and something like this guy here um cheesecloth muslin co cloth co cotton um and tie that off and uh, put that inside your still is a great way to infuse botanicals and to keep them all in one place so <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed a question. <laughs> that was up when I was talking about that. Would you still do a spirit run and take cuts with an air still? Um, Nick, do you want to take that one? You've done some gin on the air still. Yeah, so um, personally, um, I think it's great to be, uh, start off with, with the best you can. So in this case, um, uh, starting off with uh, the best of the hearts run. So, you know, do your... Uh, a stripping run if you want to do that and then uh, um, a spirit run to really um, and your cups to, to get a nice clean hearts uh, or if you don't want to do the stripping run some people don't then um, just do a, a, a spirit run and, and, and do your cuts there make sure you've got a nice clean neutral to play with uh, and then yeah so with the air still then um, again you can do your cuts all the way through um, which as, as Aaron has said um, and there's also a lot of people will take um, an initial cut uh, say on the air still, it might be, say, 50 mil, um, where you get a lot of, because you're already starting with, say, a heart, a good hearts run, neutral if you want, um, you get that rid of that first 50 mil, which typically can have a lot of the harsher um, um, botanical and other, uh, or the um, juniper and other botanical um, elements that you may not want um, in there. Again, have a bit of a taste, see if it's something you want. Uh, and then typically a lot of people will finish the run at about uh, 25 to 30% um, ABV, and some even a bit higher than that, depending. Um, if you do go too far into the tails run on your botanical run, uh, you do risk a bit of uh, uh, a can louche, or you can start seeing some of the oils on the surface 
um, that uh, are just no longer uh, soluble. So uh, it's always handy to do some cuts. It just depends what you're doing and how you want to do it again. Yeah, yeah, great point about those oils. Um, would you anchor down the cloth somehow? Uh, it really depends on your skill. All you, you don't want it to be in your boiler, as we've just talked about. Um, what, where you do want it is somewhere where the vapor is forced to pass through it, which is why those botanical baskets are quite nice to have. Um, uh, just following uh, into the condenser arm or up through a, a reflu an empty reflux column, that sort of thing. You don't want to, you want to, you don't want to create resistance after the botanicals have passed through because that creates resistance for the oils. You don't want to create reflux in the still. You want those oils to pass through with the alcohol. Um, and as Nick mentioned, those oils do start to separate at a certain point. And it's always good to kind of kind of watch for that as well. Yeah, just one thing with back on that is um, I've seen some people uh, do hang the bag just from the lid and, and it's hanging in the steam. Um, it can work to a degree. However, just remember that uh, the steam's going to find uh, and the vapor is going to find the path of least resistance um, out. Uh, so you're not going to have it all go through a bag that isn't, um, you know, directly where uh, the vapor can escape. So um, it can work. You may get a lighter uh, gin. So it's just something to think about. What I have done is I've put those that botanical bag in a reflux column before. Um, it has to come up through that column just that's my packing. I'm not using any packing. Uh, 30 grams of uh, biologicals. Can you only use them once? Yeah, it's a good idea. You're going to strip most of the oil out and the oil that's left is going to be, you know, not great. Not to mention they're going to be soggy botanicals. They're probably going to go bad on you by the next time you run your still. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's not really something you want or need to do. Plus it becomes very variable um if you're really going to try to reuse botanicals Aaron, uh, that's a nice reminder um about botanicals we've talked about this and nick you brought up the oil thing remember the, the principle behind distillation of course is as we're moving you know we're removing things as we're kind of moving up the boiling point and oftentimes we're also moving up the not to sound too geeky here but the molecular weight and you get into those very large oil molecules and they tend to be the harsh you know those are like the, the terpenes, things like that, those those harsh chemicals that, um, you know, you might find them to be far more solvent-like than they are uh, aromatic and pleasant. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Cool. So, how do we put some of these methods to use? Is a uh, what we're going to cover off here next. So, um, we have talked a little bit about the air star still. There's a great little drawing of him uh, down in the left corner. Nice, simple little still. Um, and, uh, this is going to be in, uh, metric. I'll do a little bit of conversion for you, but four liters is pretty much a gallon, uh, which is what this still can handle. Um, and, uh, there's a nice little botanicals recipe off to the right here. And we were talking about, um, you know, using, um, the right volume or amount of botanicals. And there's some good charts out there in terms of, um, what percentage and that sort of thing um, of botanicals you typically want to use in a blend. And, um, and juniper is typically the largest. Uh, and then lemon peel, coriander seed, orris root, licorice root, angelica root, and coffee or cinnamon are all botanicals we've kind of focused on today. And this is a really nice base blend. Now, this is pretty much what we'd call a London dry uh, gin. Um, you could play around with this uh, to a certain extent and add some of those unique uh, uh, local botanicals that you might have available in your own garden into a recipe like this without too much fuss. Now, you could pull some of these back if you really wanted to, um, but if you're just playing around, I think this is a really good, um, really good recipe to start with. So uh, you'll notice that we've also put so this is just a sugar dextrose wash base. Um, really simple, easy. It's going to be a fairly clean fermentation. For those of you um, that haven't fermented, sugar or dextrose is a very basic sugar, and it's going to ferment very easily. Um, if you use that gin yeast that we're recommending, the uh, Still Spirits Distillers gin yeast, it's going to be a nice, clean uh, fermentation. It's, you do need to use some nutrients in there um, because there isn't really nutrition for the yeast and the sugar. And then the turbocarbon and turboclear are optional, but they will help 
drop protein and yeast out of suspension and the carbon will clean up um, any sort of uh, uh, kind of nasty sort of uh, fermentation things that may have happened. Uh, but typically with sugar, if you're fermenting at room temperature, um, you know, it's, uh, it's going to ferment pretty well. And I do believe we've got the same recipe or a similar recipe for a 25 liter wash. And that would be six point six and a half gallons, 6.6, somewhere right around there. Again, dextrose, gin, yeast, um, light spirit, nutrient, uh, carbon, and turbo clear. And I believe if you look at the Still Spirits website in the craft distilling section, there's a good booklet with a uh, gin recipe that'll talk you through step by step in terms of um, how best to ferment and, uh, and make this wash. Now, uh, the basic equipment is really just going to be a, either a plastic bucket fermenter or a glass fermenter or a stainless fermenter, something that you can put an airlock on and protect this, uh, from the air and any sort of bugs in the air that could get in there. And, um, seven to 10 days and you'll be, uh, you'll be on your way, um, in terms of that fermentation. So, uh, one thing to call out is that if you do want to use different botanicals in your recipe, um, we do have a pocket series guide to botanicals coming out, and I believe it's going to be available online as well, and we may share a link with you, I believe, in the Facebook chat um, so that you guys can start looking at uh, really more in depth on some of these uh, botanicals. Uh, but this is a pretty straightforward vapor infusion recipe for those of you that are interested in getting your feet wet with a tried and true uh, London dry gin recipe. If there aren't any questions on those recipes, I believe, um, not sure what other information uh, we have at the moment, I believe, uh, take a look for that gin uh, botanical booklet um, that I just mentioned. And um, I think that's probably near the end of our presentation. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to add in terms of uh, information for the first time fermenter uh, gin bot uh, botanist distiller? I guess from my end, you know, just to summarize back a couple things we pointed out, like Nick uh you and i have all said is less is more start with uh a smaller charge of botanicals than you think you may want to have you know uh you you're you're extracting with alcohol uh which means that you know alcohol is a is a rather potent solvent it's going to help pull things out pretty quickly so use a little less try it out if it's not enough you can always up it up your game later uh, and you don't need to have the other thing, like even Justine pointed out, you don't need to have um, a sophisticated load of a ton of botanicals. You can do this with two or three things and you're going to get something unique. It's going to stand out. In fact, uh, because Justine mentioned uh, el elderflower, I think uh, I ended up having to take a little sip of one of my elderflower gins that I have. So very <laughs> simple, light botanical. Um, but some of these things will come out and they will stun you with how nice they are if you don't overload it with with so many other botanicals. Hmm. Yeah, great call out, great call. Out. Uh, along the same mantra, uh, less is more. Um, but in terms of I'm not talking in terms of volume, um, you know, don't think you have to go and fill a 25 liter boiler and 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 maximize your output. Play around, experiment with just enough to make maybe a couple of bottles um, if your boiler allows or like an air still or something like that because that will allow you uh, to really you know play with um, uh, the flavors and find out what you like and the other thing which uh, I've said for years in the brewing world as well is is keep a notebook keep your notes about what you've done and and anything little tiny because and, and again only change one or two things the next batch because if you go and change more than that you're not really knowing exactly what is uh, imparting there properly for you so uh yeah play around and and taste lots of gin and as you can see you know there's lots of uh commercial styles available that you can really um you know and, and lots of variants these days so to so have, have a taste you know um 
we all say we get into home brewing and things to save money, but uh, unfortunately, that's just an excuse we tell often to other people who live in our houses with us to justify it. I spend more now on craft gins and things like that and beers than, than I ever have. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely <laughs> right. Um, we've got a question that we should cover off before we head out. Uh, may have a few more. I apologize. If you still have a question, definitely drop it our way. Uh, when creating a recipe, is distilling individual botanicals and using them to blend up uh, a useful method? It definitely can be. Now, it's not something that we talk about a lot on the home distillation side, uh, mostly because you have to do so many runs and there's so many botanicals, but you can build. Um, with those bases. And there's even some commercial distilleries that do exactly this um, just to play around. Now, what they'll oftentimes do is they'll brew their base recipe up and do that. And then they'll have other uh, botanical gins that they maybe blend in to create different recipes and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, keep in mind that we did talk a little bit about base notes and carriers and that sort of thing. So starting with a base gin recipe is still a very good idea. Even if you want to play around with some of those, you can blend gins. Um, you can blend a, a basic juniper and elderflower gin with something that's a little more dynamic and that sort of thing. Um, individually, yeah, you can do it. You might just be spending a lot of time distilling out very specific recipes. Um, and when you could probably be playing around more so just with your botanical blend in the still. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, it's sometimes it's really hard to do that if you're talking about something like cardamom, which you're not going to use a lot of anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, to put that into uh, a gin in, in quantity uh, gets very strong and it actually might bitter your alcohol a little bit too much as well. So um, it's, it's a method you can play around with, but uh, also beware <laughs> um what you do there yeah <laughs> just, just, just with that um something to think about too and and you know some people like using the flavorings um and some don't so much uh but the kit like this um has uh, a whole bunch of the different flavorings uh, available in here it can often help with perception and and, and tasting of those different uh, uh botanicals and what you um you may or may not like so that can, uh, you know, is a, is a different way of, of, of uh, uh, experimenting and finding that out for yourself. Yeah, definitely. Um, experimenting with blood orange gin, what is the best way to add color? Um, you know, you can do this with the juice of the blood orange, if you'd like, as a steeping method at the end. Now, um, it's uh, it's one of those things that gets a little tricky because the color of blood orange is different than the peel, et cetera. But um, the other thing you can do is add some juice in. That's going to add some haziness. Um, can also always uh, add some filtered juice. Like you could actually carbon filter juice and that sort of thing. We're talking about some random techniques here a little bit, but there are different ways to put in that color. Um, you know, there's also coloring in a lot of different ways. Uh, but uh, that's probably the most natural way to do it is uh, post-distillation steeping of the fruit itself. All right. So there was a quick question that came up, um, and, and I know we put an answer on there quickly, but uh, in, in terms of dried versus fresh botanicals, um, I just want to touch quickly on this. Um, anyone who's dried uh, fruit or anything like that will know um, that the character can change somewhat. Um, so whilst a lot of the botanicals we use in, in, in gin making are already dried, um, if you do have some fresh, try it and see what different uh, tastes it can impart. You know, you, you look at some of the, um, you know, and, and I'm into a lot of, um, uh, you know, dehydrating my own uh, garnishes for gin and things like that. Um, but you know, and, and my uncle had a, a plum farm and, you know, uh, had the, uh, the industrial size dryer and, and for prunes. So, you know, you, your sugars are going to concentrate in certain fruits and botanicals and things like that. So you can often get a slightly different um, uh, taste or, or aromas from that. So, again, something to play with and see what you like. Uh, yeah. One more bit to that, Nick, uh, contribution is... Uh, so there have been a few times I've used certain botanicals that when they are fresh, they have imparted a little bit of a vegetal flavor and the dried one did not. So in some trials that I did several years ago, we noted that Absolutely. A, little, a, little, a little vegetal. It wasn't, a, it wasn't um, 
it wasn't enough to say you wouldn't like it, but it was distracting enough to say I'd rather have it in that dry form. Yeah, you just gotta yep. it. Yeah, and you may point. find that fresh ones or whatever may lend itself better to different techniques, maceration, steeping, or vapor infusion. So uh, there's a lot gin is making is so huge, and a lot of it is is still experimenting and finding. Um, you know, there's no real right way to do it. And uh, as Justine said too, you know, a lot of people do a lot of different things, follow the basics, but then um, you know, experiment. And on that note, go out make gin <laughs> have fun really appreciate you guys joining us today uh thanks to mike and nick thanks to justine um it was really great talking to her mount fife distillery um if you're interested check out the still spirits website for more information we do have a pocket guide on botanicals uh coming out here and that's gonna um, really give you a lot of great information really appreciate all the questions thank you for the comments um Hope we can make a few more uh, gin makers out of uh, you folks out there. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everybody. Thank you.